Good morning. And good morning to those um, watching online. It seems all those who watch online normally sit in the front of the church. Um, that's a disproportionate kind of move from the front church people to the online service. So please come back and sit in the front next Sunday. That would be great. Um, but to those of you who are in another suburb back there, welcome. Thank you for coming to church today. I can't really see you very well, but I think there are people back there. Um, well, Jonah, what a, what a crazy story. Um, and I know this is your third uh, message on it, so I know that you're already familiar with kind of some of the strangeness and the kind of power of it. I guess in some respects we've, we can become complacent to the story of Jonah because we've seen so many kind of Sunday school booklets and, you know, kids' books, you know, cartoon-type drawings of Jonah and, and the whale. I guess Jonah and Noah would be the kind of the, the two most popular Old Testament stories that even in kind of secular culture kind of still get turned into kids' books. And sometimes we can imagine them as kind of quaint kids' stories. But the story of Jonah was actually incredibly important to the people of Israel at a really important moment in their history. Uh, it's actually full of very potent kind of power, uh, far more than just a kind of a cute story about a guy getting swallowed by a fish. So as we, as I remind you of some of the stuff that you've been looking at up until this point and then finish off this book, I pray that it might have the same kind of ouch factor for us today as it had for its first hearers um, thousands of years ago. So I'm going to pray. Then we'll have a look at these two chapters, two short chapters, and wrap up this uh, series on uh, the book of Jonah. So let's pray together. Father God, I pray as we come to your word that you would ensure the words that I speak are acceptable in your sight. You are our Lord and our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Okay, now as you know, like the story of Jonah was set during the reign of King Jeroboam uh, in the northern kingdom, but actually the story itself doesn't really take root and get lots of currency and gets told again and again until sometime after that. In fact, after Israel had returned from exile. So you'd be familiar with the fact that the Assyrians and the Babylonians were kind of swirling around Judah and Israel and eventually the Babylonians kind of gobbled them all up and... Uh, desecrate the temple and destroy the city of Jerusalem and drag the people of God into uh, uh, slavery. And it's a time of great shame and humiliation for Israel. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a theological crisis for them because they believe that they were the chosen people and their God is the only God. So how does this pagan country end up having so much power over them? It shakes them to their very core, as I guess you can imagine any country that's taken, uh, humiliated and taken into slavery. And ultimately, of course, the empire of Babylon kind of swells and becomes in, uh, kind of swept up into the great Persian Empire and their king, Cyrus the Great, decides to grant all the slaves from various conquered nations the right to return to their homeland and the, the Israelites do. The remnant returns back to the land that we now know as Israel in order to rebuild their nation. Can you imagine? Rebuild a nation, like ay ay ay. That's not just like Nehemiah building like the walls of a city. That's like re-establishing a whole culture. That's like re-establishing an economy. That's about re-establishing the, the, the worship of Yahweh. I mean, it's an extraordinary task that they have to undertake. And, of course, they are humiliated and frightened people. And so it's during this time, we call it the kind of post-exilic era, the period after the exile, as Israel is trying to rebuild itself and reconstitute itself as a nation of people under the one true and only God, Yahweh, voices start to emerge. And you can kind of understand this, really, can't you? Voices start to emerge who say to Israel, we should be terribly anxious about the other nations around us. As I said, you can understand why this is the case. They've been crushed by a pagan nation around them. And so there starts to become voices calling Israel to be chiefly and only concerned about itself, to really kind of make sure the, the boundaries around Israel are really clear. 
Voices start to cry out and to say, we should be only concerned about ourselves, unconcerned about the rest of the world. And in the end, a kind of a form of toxic religion starts to emerge, one which is kind of really legalistic and fear-based and controlling, a kind of understanding of what it means to follow Yahweh, which is that Yahweh is for us and not for anybody else. And as they're trying to re-establish this nation, of course, bloodlines become really important because they are descended from the 12 tribes of Israel. And so there's no marriage to anyone who is outside of our particular religious faith or our ethnic line. There's fear, there's xenophobia, there's anxiety. And as I said, you can kind of understand why that would be the case. However... Those true and faithful Israelites knew there had always been a note sounded all the way through the history of Israel, all the way through all of their scriptures, in fact, not randomly, but regularly, a note sounded that declared that Israel was to be a gift to the nations of the world. They knew, in fact, on multiple occasions in the book of Genesis, when God promises Abraham he would be the father of a great nation, built into that promise was, it is through your descendants that God shall be a light to the nations. It's through your descendants that God will bring blessing to those who are in the north and the south and the east and the west. You don't just find it in the book of Genesis and the promises to Abraham, you find it all the way through. You find it in multiple occasions through the Psalms. You find it in the prophecies of Isaiah right before the exile. That our task is to bless and to be a light to the nations that all peoples might come and bow down before Yahweh their God. We are to be a people for others, Israel knew. And yet these voices that said, Israel first, Israel only, hate the outsider, fear the outsider, these voices were strong and loud and powerful. Now, folks, it doesn't take a great stretch for us to think what this might be like. We've seen it in recent years, have we not? Anxieties about outsiders coming to Australia, especially those who might arrive by boat. Ay, ay, ay. You've seen it in the, the, the policies of Donald Trump, make America great again or America first. We've seen it in the Brexit campaigns, come out, let's be separate, we're different from them. You see it again and again and again. When fear takes root, we pull up the gangplank, we close off the borders, we take care of us because God is just for our people. And when voices speak that way, it's blunt, it's simplistic, it's very hard to compete against, don't you realise? So when someone during the post-exilic period is saying, Israel only, Israel first, God is for us, God lives within these boundaries, that's a very simple message. It's a blunt message. And when those voices who are trying to compete against that, to call Israel back to its true identity as a blessing to the nations, when they are saying things like, well, Yes, holiness is, is, is something we should be committed to and fidelity to our covenant with God. And yes, our bloodline is important. And yes, we should be concerned about the way we are conducting ourselves as an alternative society, as different to the world around us. But we have to keep that in balance with the fact that we are also called to be a blessing to the nations and that we should be concerned for the outsider and practice hospitality and grace and mercy and be sent into all the world. That's a much more nuanced kind of message, right? And as you know, when you're trying to combat a really simplistic, blunt message, like make America great again, a nuanced, sophisticated message often gets crushed by it. Do you follow? Sometimes those messages just can't get through. Often the way to combat a really blunt, really simplistic message is not necessarily to come at it front on. Often, sometimes, the best way to compete against a really brutalist kind of message like that is to slip underneath it in a more subversive kind of way. And often, story and song are usually the most powerful tools that the prophet has, aren't they? Because a song can kind of get into your mind and start to shape your thinking even before you realise what's going on. And story 
You can get swept up into the narrative and before you know it, you realise, wait a second, I'm thinking differently. You might be familiar the time when uh, King David has Bathsheba brought to his, his bedchamber. He sleeps with her. This is like an abuse of power. This is sexual assault. This is rape, really. And then he, after she becomes pregnant, he then conspires and orchestrates for her husband to be killed in battle. This is murder. I mean, this is despicable behaviour, as you know. And the prophet, Nathan, the prophet of God, has to go to him and confront him about this. And if he comes direct on to David about this, it's like, um, the Lord has told me you're guilty of rape, sexual assault, abuse of power, murder. Do you think you're going to last very long as the court prophet? Coming straight on to, to David's brutal, simple lifestyle? That ain't going to work. But you know what the prophet does, don't you? He tells a story, a cute story, a story about a man who has more sheep than he knows what to do with, who takes the one sheep of another man to slaughter for his guest's meal. It's a despicable story of a flagrant abuse of power. And David, before he knows it, gets all swept up in the story and the narrative, and he's like feeling all outraged. It's like, who is this man? Like, bring him to me. And the prophet can turn to him and say, you are this man. The story has slipped underneath his defences. It breaks open a new reality. And David is broken and repents. Well, folks, I think that's what the story of Jonah does for Israel after the exile. At a time of xenophobia, religious nationalism, fear, myopia and anxiety... This story, an ancient story for Israel at that time, this story starts to get told and told and told again. And this story does the same kind of power that Nathan's story does for David. It slips under their defences. It starts to work away at the foundations of that kind of really brutalist, toxic form of nationalism and cracks open new realities and new ways of thinking. You see, if you were to ask a Jew at that time, can you tell me, where could I go to be completely out of the presence of God? Is there anywhere I could go where God is not? Actually, a Jew at this time would have an answer for you. There are places you could go where God would not be present. Two would come to mind immediately. The first one is that they would say, well, if you want to go somewhere where God is not, I guess you would go to the underworld. You would go to the, to the dark, writhing chaos underneath the earth. Remember, these are ancient peoples. They used to believe the earth was flat and it was on pillars and that there was a big blue dome over it and above that was the heavens and under the earth was this writhing, watery, dark, chaotic place. They also used to believe the only way to get to that dark and chaotic place was to go to the waters, to the ocean at the edge of the flat earth. And this is inconceivable. But if you could dive into the ocean and go down, 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 you would end up in this dark underworld. Like it's fanciful, but that's where you could go, where Yahweh would not be present. Well, what did you learn about last week when you look at chapter 2? Where does Jonah go? Jonah goes to the edge of the planet, to the edge of the flat earth, into the ocean, down, down, down he goes into the swirling, dark, chaotic, terrifying underworld. Ancient peoples believed that there were things like, like leviathans and behemoths and horrible, despicable, blind sea monsters and terrifying creatures. And what happens? The prophet is swept up by this, gobbled up by some terrifying sea monster. Oh, of course, that's what you'd expect. Except, no, this is the hand of God who cocoons him safely for three days in the depths of the underworld and then delivers him to shore well, as you discovered last week, he vomits him onto the shore. <laughs> Jonah goes to the place where any Jew at that time would think, God is not present. 
and blow me down if God is not actually present. This great fish is the hand of God's grace revealed to him even in the darkest and most unlikely place. Well, chapter 3 begins, as you just heard, with Jonah finally like, all right, all right, I'll go to Nineveh. And did you notice the way in which having gone to this great place, this great and evil city, it takes three days for him to go through the city, I guess, to every market, every square, every forum, in order to proclaim this message. Now, I said to you that Jews at that time would think that there were two places that God would not be present. One would be in the underworld, and Jonah has just actually encountered God in the underworld. But the second place would be in the heart of a pagan city like Nineveh. Nineveh was known for its brutality and its cruelty. Nineveh was known to have a king or a ruler who was particularly brutal. This was a place of pagan sacrifices, human sacrifices and orgiastic uh, uh, worship. This was a terrifying, dark place. If you asked a Jew in the post-exilic period, where could I go to flee from God? Oh, you could go to the underworld, but that's kind of impossible. Or you could go to the heart of a city like Nineveh. And in this story, this story which slips in under the defences of that kind of really brutal form of uh, religious nationalism in Israel at that time, Jonah spends three days in the belly of a monster in the underworld. God protects him and delivers him. And then in chapter 3, he spends three days in the belly of the beast of Nineveh. And guess what? Not only is he present in that place, not only does he preach, and I suspect particularly half-heartedly, what he discovers is 120,000 people, including the king of Nineveh himself, the brutal, violent, cruel, despicable pagan king. All of them drop to their knees in repentance, cover themselves in sackcloth and ashes and repent of their sin. I mean, heck, they even put, a sackcloth, put, even put ashes on their animals to repent. I mean, this is repentance upon repentance, right? This is what this story is about. It's telling us, can you tell me some place where God would not be? Because what Jonah has discovered is you could go to the belly of the underworld or the belly of a pagan city and God is very present. And God's grace is at work in those places. Can you see how this story would be such an affront to anyone who is saying to you, God lives with us. God lives here. God is perceived by us in our context. God operates within these particular geographic boundaries. God is ours, in our temple, in our way of worship. And this story starts to get told again and again and again about the way in which Jonah can go to the very places where we presume God would be not, the darkest and most despicable places, and what he encounters is grace. The power of God at work. My friends, this is a radical story for its time. And you'd think in some respects you could kind of finish the story at the end of chapter 3, don't you think? Have you ever read Jonah and thought to yourself, let's just leave chapter 4 off, shall we? Like, what the heck is that all about? Chapter 3 ends with the king repenting, the city turning, God staying his hand, uh, it's been revealed to us that God is present even in Nineveh, even in the darkest oceans. That's a lovely story, a beautiful story of the way in which God is present everywhere and his grace abounds. And oh my gosh, we should have realized we should be for all the nations, not just for ourselves. So why is chapter 4 there? Because chapter 4 is the trick on Israel. In chapter 4, Jonah behaves particularly badly, right? Right? In chapter 4, Jonah goes outside of the city and waits. Remember, he gives them the 40 days to repent. He only spends three in the city. 
out he comes to watch and to wait. And as we discover later, he's pretty much waiting for fire to rain down on heaven because like, he preached but tried not to be very convincing about it, then got out of there and just thought he would wait and watch as God condemns this evil city. And the 40 days pass and lo and behold, little did he know, but they have repented and God has stayed his hand. And then Jonah says this, and it's really, really pathetic. He says in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 4, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I was trying to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a generous and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sentencing calamity. Oh, now, Lord, take my life from me. It's better for me that I die than to live. The first hearers of this story would have been laughing. It's like, what a whiny baby. It's like you knew all along that if you preached in Nineveh, your gracious and compassionate God would forgive them. You knew what you should have known. Our God is a God for the nations. You knew what you should have known, that if you repent, if you preach in Nineveh, they will repent. And if they repent, you knew our God is compassionate and gracious and he would forgive them. You knew all that along. You didn't flee because you were afraid of the Ninevites. You freed because you were afraid of God being God. And now God has been God, gracious and loving, even to the Ninevites. And we wish you were dead. And if that's not bad enough, just to rub it in even more, God plays a dirty, rotten trick on Jonah, right? Like he gives him this plant to grow up, has leafy leaves, quite lovely in the midday sun. He also sends a hot wind just so that, you know, he'll feel especially kind of calmed and cooled by this, this vine. And then the very next day he sends a worm to kill it and it dies. And how does Jonah respond to this? Again, it's so good. Um... Jonah does his block, he cracks it, and then verse 9, God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about this plant? And listen to Jonah, he says, it is. I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. Chapter 4 is important because it makes you laugh at Jonah and how pathetic he is that he should be so concerned about a plant and so completely unconcerned about the people of Nineveh. And here's the point, folks. When this story was told, and we get to this point, when whiny Jonah is complaining about the plant dying or about God being gracious, this is the point at which the storyteller would say, don't laugh. You are this man. This story works in the same way as the prophet Nathan's story does. It makes you laugh. Well, Nathan's story makes you angry at the person, the story, and then David realises it's him. This story, you laugh at Jonah for his pathetic myopia, for his simplistic nationalism, for his dumb and ill-conceived understandings of God. And as you laugh at it, the storyteller says, don't laugh. You do the same. You've become so concerned about the minutiae, about the following of these particular rules, about the dotting of these I's and the crossing of these T's. You've become so concerned about turning our faith into a legalistic form of nationalism, frightened of the outsider, terrified of doing something wrong, desperately trying to win over God's favour in some way. You have lost sight of the very thing to which we were called which is to be a robust people of God sent into all the world. You have lost your compassion even for your enemies like Nineveh, but you are so moved by the leaf of a vine. Does this not remind you of something that Jesus once said? When speaking to the Pharisees, he said, you strain out a gnat but you're quite happy to swallow a camel. 
It's a sort of ridiculous saying, isn't it? Because the Aramaic for gnat and camel sound very similar, so it's a play on words. But he's saying the same thing. You're more concerned about tiny little things and unconcerned about the very things that you should be concerned about. The people to whom Jonah was first told would later be represented in Jesus' time by the Pharisees. The Pharisees who told people, God's concerns are about geography. God is for us. And you should follow these certain rules and live out this certain lifestyle. And you should commit to this level of legalism in order for God's presence to be felt in this world. And we should resist and hate and despise the Gentile, the outsider. And for them, the Romans were now insiders. We should resist them. We should hate them and despise them and wish for the day when they will be defeated and we will rise up again and be the closed people of God that we should be. And Jesus comes to them and says, you are more concerned about a vine leaf than you are about the 120,000 people. So much so that just in case it isn't clear to you, he actually publicly identifies himself with the story of Jonah. So that we have in um, Matthew chapter 12, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees who just come to him and said, oh, well, if you're really who you say you are, give us a sign. You know, prove it, show us. And Jesus responds to them in verse, uh, uh, this is Matthew 12, 39. A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given except, except the sign of Jonah, he says. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom and now something greater then Solomon is here. In, some, in one respect, he's saying, I am in the tradition of Jonah in the same way that he was buried beneath the oceans for three days. I'll be buried beneath the soil for three days. And then we both defeat death and, uh, and, and, and are used by God. But in another sense, he's saying much more than just that. Just as Jonah was dead for three days, so will I be. In another sense, he's also saying, just as the gospel of Israel was for the people of Nineveh and they repented, just as the gospel of Israel was for the queen of Sheba and that she acknowledged the greatness of God, just as all throughout history we've been told again and again and again we are not just for ourselves but we are a gift to the world. I have come. I have come to fulfill the covenant to unleash the Holy Spirit, to transform us into a people sent into all the world. You'll find this again and again through the teaching of Jesus. In John chapter 10, when he says, I am the good shepherd, he talks about how I will call my sheep by my name, the, the sheep of Israel, they will follow me. But he also says, but I have sheep from other flock." that I will call and they will join us. What? In Mark's Gospel, when uh, Jesus feeds the 5,000, there were 12 baskets of food left over, 12 representing the 12 tribes of Israel. I've come to feed Israel. But just a couple of chapters later, Mark records, he feeds the 4,000. And there are seven baskets left over, representing the seven lost Gentile nations. Later on, he even says to his disciples, did you figure that out? How many baskets here? Twelve. How many baskets there? Seven. You got it? From the very beginning, Jesus' mission was to remind Israel and call it into its destiny as a people for the world. And then, of course, after his death and resurrection, he says to his disciples, go, therefore, into all the world and make disciples. He is Jonah, but greater. He is Solomon, but greater. He's David, but greater. He is the one that reminds Israel they are a peculiar people. They are a holy people. They are a set-apart people. 
but holy and set apart for the purpose of being sent into the world to invite people to bend their knee before Yahweh, or in our case now, before Jesus as their King and Saviour. Do you all follow? And what's this got to do with us? That's all just for Israel, isn't it? Well, friends, Christians are just as inclined to a toxic, closed-off, fear-based, myopic religion, aren't we? We're just as inclined to setting up rules and laws of behaviour that rule the outsider out. Some Christians have even gotten so good at this, they won't even talk to other Christians that happen to believe something different to them. We've become so good at deciding God is ours and how you must behave in order to be in relationship with God. Christians throughout the ages have found themselves committing the same sin that the generation of Jonah made. We don't think that God is just in Australia, but we start to think of God being just ours and our particular ways. If you happen to believe something different about the role of the Holy Spirit, if you happen to believe something different about the sovereignty of God, if you happen to believe something different about the role of women, if you have to believe something different about your understanding of the return of Christ, if you happen to believe something different based on your study of Scripture from my study of Scripture, then we can have nothing to do with each other any longer, right? So out we go, or out you go. As soon as you find yourself thinking this way, you're finding yourself living out the, 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 the vision of the Pharisees, living out the vision of the generation of Jonah. Yeah, the story of Jonah and, of course, the story of the ministry of Jesus remind us fundamentally that to be filled with the Spirit of God, to be set free from fear and sin and death and the devil, is to become big-hearted, open-handed, generous, inclusive, loving, to not be afraid of a different view or a different perspective. Do not have to control God or have him the way we like him, but to dare to believe that our God does things that sometimes we consider to be scandalous. Where could I go to flee from your presence if I made my bed in the depths? You are there. north, the south, the east, the west. This is May Missions Month, my friends. We believe that our gospel is for all nations, but I also want to remind you, we believe that our faith is the antidote to toxic, controlling, fear-based religion. We have been set free. Live as free ones. We have had our hearts enlarged, our vision expanded. We are the ones called to love and to love and to love. If you can't love your own brother and sister with whom you happen to disagree with on one point or another, you are more concerned about the vine leaf than about the 120,000 in Nineveh right outside our doors. Do you follow? Let me pray. Father, free us from straining at gnats, from loving vine leaves, from having to dot every I and cross every T and to control everything about what your spirit wants to do. And remind us of the message of Jonah, that there's nowhere we could go to flee from your presence, that there is no one who is beyond your redemptive love. Send us. Send us around the world. Send us across the oceans. But also send us 
to the church down the road, to our neighbours next door, to our work colleagues, to those that we do life with, that we might be reminded of the extraordinary, subversive story of Jonah, that we can get so whiny, we can get so self-focused, that as we laugh at Jonah in this story, let us be reminded that we should never become like this. Let us follow our friend, our rock, our saviour, our Lord, our King Jesus, who calls people from all tribes and nations. Fill us with a robust, free, hospitable and generous spirit to go and to make disciples of all nations. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.